Hi, I'm Sonu. I'm the founder at Zeng, and I'm very excited to be talking to you today about the open source work we are doing around entity resolution. So before founding Zing, which is an open source entity resolution framework, I was running a data consultancy and dealing with a variety of data engineering and data science problems. It's my third time as a speaker at the summit here, and it's been great to reconnect with old friends and to make new ones. I hope you are all enjoying the summit too. Now coming to the problem of entity resolution, what we see in organizations is that there are a lot of data systems which capture bits and pieces about core business entities like customers, locations, suppliers, products, and parts. Now, these data systems are essential because they let the revenue teams, the operations teams, the product teams perform their core business functions. Sometimes it's change in the technical landscape, which causes these multiple data systems. Sometimes it's a collection of SaaS tools, mergers and acquisitions, a mix of legacy and modern systems, or different systems across different departments. But eventually, as companies grow, and as they become more and more advanced, they start missing out a good view of the core entities with whom they are dealing with. Now, this is problematic because if we have five different records, all of them of the same customer, and we count them as five distinct customers, really can we do even like customer lifetime value or churn prediction? Not to think about advanced use cases like personalization and recommendation or compliance or cost saving for suppliers and consolidation of supplies. And this is primarily what entity resolution is. Building out a trusted, consistent, and unified view of the core business entities across different data systems. This resolved entities can then be matched up, can then be enhanced with the transactional data to do the analytics and the recommendations that we need. Now, entity resolution, like we kind of you know want to do it, but then when we come to doing it, there is a big problem in terms of really how do we define across different systems, across different attributes, what is the right way to match these records up? Different data systems and different systems have different ways of capturing the information. They have different schemas. They have different validation rules. And all of them lead to a complexity in programmatically defining the right way and the best way to say that multiple records should actually be matched up together. Along with that, there is a problem of scale. How do we compare every record with every other record? Because there are no unique identifiers. The idea behind the entity resolution or identity resolution is in fact to build up these unique identifiers. So in absence of that, we actually end up comparing every record with every other record. And it becomes, even with small sizes of data, the problem suddenly just blows up because we're doing Cartesian joints. So, and when we have 10,000 records, we're actually comparing 10,000 against 9,999. And the moment we scale up to even 10 times what we have, the scale of comparison, the number of comparisons that we need to do becomes 100 times. So when we started building Zing, we were very conscious of these two problems that we had seen. And we wanted to make sure that if we build something, we should be able to handle the variety of entities that we have been seeing, which is customers, suppliers, addresses, organizations, 
we also wanted to be able to deal with or not having to deal with rules, which is not having to programmatically define how really those entities should match up. Because this is, again, a very time-consuming, complex, and inaccurate way of doing it. The third design goal that we had is that we wanted the, uh, the framework to actually scale easily to the variety, to the size of data that is present in most organizations, which is easily runs into multi-million. Now, with these design goals, we looked at, you know, ways in which we could solve this. And machine learning immediately become, became a very, very attractive uh, option to go with. The reason is that with machine learning, you can actually learn from the data. And you really don't have to define any rules. So if we could learn from the data, we did not have to hand code the rules. And we could deal with the variety of entities because the patterns would be picked up from within the training data. So those two goals immediately became very obvious uh, to be solved through ML. But scale of data was a tricky one because uh, the kind of pre-clustering or the kind of uh, uh, <clears throat> comparisons needed in entity resolution uh, cannot actually be solved by simple clustering like k-means because k-means and other clustering algorithms you need to know beforehand what are the number of clusters that you need uh, here we are talking about micro clustering because in maybe uh, 20 million records you will have five or six records which should match up together so <clears throat> this was a different kind of a problem and which not immediately an ml based off the shelf uh, way to solve it but we still felt that you know we could actually learn from some training data and build out a custom cluster and then use Spark to distribute this. So with this approach, we set out to build Zing. And uh, when, we, uh, uh, when we kind of started doing it, and uh, uh, one thing that we realized is that to build out those models, the, to build out the ML thing itself, we needed training data. Now really, how do we get training data? I mean, it's really difficult for uh, an, uh, an organization to already have handling handy uh, matches and non-matches to <clears throat> supply to the framework. So uh, with some deliberation, we built out an active learning framework. Uh, training data set creation is one of the leading causes why ML projects fail. And we wanted to make sure that while we were enabling people to build out their training sets, the effort was minimal. They didn't have to label a whole lot of data. And we carefully choose very representative edge, pa edge pairs, which we show to the user, which they can mark as matches and non-matches through which the algorithms learn. Now, once a decent size uh, training set has been created, which typically starts at around 50 to 60 matches and non matches, and uh, a lot more non matches because non matches happen more in the data sets. Uh, we learn a variety of models on the data. The first being the blocking model, which breaks down the records into blocks or clusters. So, this is like the clustering step that we do. It typically the blocking within Zing breaks down the problem space of comparing every record with every other record into almost 0.05% of the total possible comparisons that need to be made. And then we scale it over, we run that distributed over Spark. So that helps us to compute things faster. The pairs that we uh, get from the blocking model are fed into the similarity model, which does the pairwise matching within each block and cluster. It's a classifier that is uh, uh, that takes features of each attribute its type and uh, based on that it computes uh, at a distance and other similarity metrics and those features are fed to the classifier and once the pairwise similarity has been found 
we do some graph processing to finally build out the clusters. Now with this in hand, what happens is that uh, Zing adds three extra columns to your input, which are the minimum score, the maximum score, and the cluster ID, which we call the Z cluster. The Z cluster uniquely represents an entity, which means that here in this example, record three, record Z cluster with three of three with record uh, 1022 are actually the same although they have variations across the addresses. And <clears throat> Zing predicts that they are similar with a maximum probability of 0.99. Now, I talked about, you know, even fundamental uh, analytics being impossible, being very difficult to do without entity resolution. And this is a use case which is very, which I'm personally very, very proud of, which is the North Carolina campaign finance data, where uh, the team wanted to find out who are the donors and what is their contribution to the campaign. And as is usual, the data was messy with multiple records belonging to the same entity written in different ways, coming from different systems. With Zing, they were able to collate this together and uh, build out a unified view of that entity. Through which they were able to attribute the campaign funding. So GMMB Inc., the first row here, before doing entity resolution, it was thought that they are contributing 28K uh, uh, to, the, to the campaign. But after uh, the matching by Zing, the campaign was, the funding was found to be far, far more. And this is how, you know, uh, uh, you like one can be really accurate and understand really what the data is saying. So this is pretty much what I wanted to cover, uh, if you liked. Uh, the problem, if you think uh, that this could be something that you're dealing with, I would strongly encourage you to go and try Zing and give us some feedback. We are also very open to contributions, so would be that would be lovely too. I hope you've enjoyed the presentation today. Thank you so much. Bye.